uh, by IEEE ISWA chapter. The topic for today is microwave ice and snow sensors for energy and transportation applications, which will be presented by Dr. Mohammed Hossein Zarifi. Uh, Mohammed Hossein Zarifi has received his Bachelor and Master of Science and uh, his, P uh, his PhD degree in Electrical and Computer Engineering from the University of Tabriz, Iran in 2004, 2006 and 2009 respectively. He is currently an Associate Professor Principal Re and uh, uh, Principal Researcher in uh, Sensors and Microelectronics with the School of Engineering at the Univers University of British Columbia and the Director of Okanagan uh, Microelectronics and the Gigahertz Application Laboratory in Canada. Prior joining the University of Tabriz, Dr. Zarif, uh, Dr. Zarif was a postdoc fellow at the University of Alberta from 2013 to 2017. He has authored and co-authored more than 75 papers in peer-reviewed journals and uh, conference and conference proceeding, as well as five issued and pending uh, patents. Dr. Zarif received CMC and RC. Uh, first place award on industrial collaboration for the innovation innovative microwave sensors in Canada at 2015. Dr. Zarifi's research focus includes design of high speed and low power analog circuits and analog to digital converters for biomedical and uh, communication applications and microwave plan uh, planner structures for sensing application. Dr. Zarifi is a senior member of IEEE and he has served as a reviewer for several journals and conferences. Uh, I need to thank Dr. Zarifi again for accepting our invitation, especially I mentioned again that uh, it is 3 a.m. now past 3 a.m. in your time and everyone's appreciating that and thank you for accepting the invitation. The floor is all yours. Uh, uh, we usually have a half an hour to 40 minutes presentation followed by questions. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Thank you, uh, Mayed, and thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, I wish I knew that you are going to read my my uh, my CV, so I definitely make it much shorter than this. But thanks a lot for the comprehensive introduction. So I'm just trying to share my screen. Uh, in that case, uh, maybe this one. Yes, I think yeah, and, we can uh, see your screen. I'll, yeah, I'm just going to put it in the slide mode. So can you see my screen now? Yes, yes, yes we, can. we can see. Okay, it. excellent. So good morning to us. Good afternoon to the people in Australia. Thanks a lot again for inviting me. Uh, today I'm going to talk about microwave ice and snow sensors for energy and transportation applications. My name is Mohamed Zarifi, and uh, I'm the director of the Omega Lab, Okanagan Microelectronics and Gigahertz Application Laboratories here in Canada in, in, at the University of British Columbia. So today's uh, presentation and, uh, and the outline for my presentation will be including a general and introductory to microwave sensors, and I'll talk about the principle of the operation of these microwave sensors. Uh, I'll give a brief introduction about the, the sensors that we are developing at Omega Lab and the, the type of the applications that we are targeting at Omega Lab. And then dive into the main topic of today's discussion, which is the ice and snow detection using microwave devices. So I'll present a couple of recent work and recent publications and the results of those publications. Uh, uh, for for uh, uh, frost and ice and uh, and uh, uh, snow detection, I will also demonstrate some sort of uh, different uh, applications uh, of of using ice sensors, specifically when you are when we are combining them with uh, with uh, super hydrophobic surfaces uh, for again energy energy applications. I also conclude my talk with some future directions that we have in our lab, and then. Uh, uh, go to the supporters of this research. So regarding to the microwave sensing, uh, just a general introduction. Uh, microwave sensors are the sensors that uh, operating basically at the frequency range from 300 megahertz to 300 gigahertz. So if you calculate the wavelength, it's in the micro range, so micrometer to millimeter range. So therefore we call them microwave devices. 
So when it comes to the microwave devices, basically we are trying to, and microwave sensors, basically, we are trying to communicate with the materials molecules. So I'm pretty sure that this is very famous that everyone knows microwave devices or RF devices are uh, providing the platform for communication between uh, person to person or a machine to machine, machine to person and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, we are trying we, we basically what we do we take the same kind of a concept from communication and this time we are just trying to communicate with the molecules instead of another transceiver uh, when it comes to the molecules specifically at the microwave region uh, and then the wavelengths that it's re uh, uh, related to the microwave we are basically dealing with the dipoles so materials with the dipole properties can respond to the microwave sensors which means that we are exciting them and they reply back to our excitations so this is the very basic way of explaining that but if, if i want to explain it more towards the uh, scientific uh, explanation here you can see that if you have an electric and magnetic field and if this electromagnetic field is start to alternate uh, so if you have a dipoles these dipoles try to change their direction so first of all the tendency of having these uh, changes are presented by a parameter we call them epsilon prime or uh, permittivity and when this variation or this change or this movement is happening definitely everything with the, with the with the with the change and with the with the uh, movement creates some sort of loss so that loss is characterized by epsilon double prime and we call the ratio of the loss to the to the permittivity as a as a tan delta or uh, loss factor so these two parameters are important because it it's a kind of a signature for a material so it changes from one material to another material and we are going to use this signature to detect materials and most and uh, 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 most specifically we are going to uh, use this to 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 detect ice and water and air and then distinguish them from each other so that's the way that we will implement our microwave sensor so Something that very interesting about the microwave devices is uh, you are dealing with just the traces of metals. So basically you have some traces of metals, you shape them in a way that you want, and based on the shape that you are implementing them, you can get different operation frequency. We, can, we call them resonator because as you can see in, the, in this figure, the energy of the, or, or the, the microwave energy is more intense or it's, it's concentrated around the frequency which, call, which we call them uh, resonant frequency. At the resonant frequency, you definitely get a resonant amplitude. So just trying to see if I can turn on my laser pointer okay so at a resonant frequency you get a resonant amplitude which is corresponding to the maximum amplitude of the of the curve or the red curve or red response of the sensor that you you can see here so moreover we can extract a 3 db quality factor which means that quality factor shows how your uh, the, your your red curve is sharp or it's broad so the quality factor is defined by resonant frequency divided by the bandwidth or 3 db bandwidth that we have over here so uh, this is basically we we borrow it from uh, communication and people from communication area so that's called that's what we call the minus 3 db but it doesn't need to be minus 3 db in science we, we, we use different numbers in order to calculate the quality factor but for now we are just sticking to the definition that we borrow from from engineers uh, specifically when they are designing uh, filters so uh, now we now we have a device and this device is just a, basically a traces of metals very stable so there is no microelectronics involved there is nothing that uh, uh, it's very uh, stable and rigid against uh, environmental changes and so on and the substrate is mainly a ceramic or it's a kind of a very stable uh, plastic uh, or teflon something like that so therefore as you can see that substrate is also very stable against uh, uh, against uh, material reactions and so on so the uh, this device creates a resonant profile like this and if you bring a material to 
some sort, some part of this device, something interesting is start to happen on the curve. So as you can see, when we bring the material to the, what we call them a sensitive region of this resonator, then the resonant profile is start to move. So when the resonant profile is start to move, that means that the resonant frequency is changing and the resonant amplitude is also changing. So we notice that by monitoring this variations, the variation of the resonant amplitude and resonant frequency, we can definitely relate that to the existence or non-existence of a material, or even uh, we can determine the different concentration of a one, let's say, material inside another or one liquid inside another. So here in this slide, you can see a lot, you can see lots of different applications that we are working on them and we have already published them in my lab. So we use these microwave resonators for biomedical applications such as bacteria detection, bacterial growth detection in a non-contact manner. And as you may notice already, because everything is operating based on the wave to molecule interaction, so therefore there is no need for a direct contact uh, between between your sensor and the materials around it. So this is this is very advantageous because first of all you are not contaminating the environment, and also if there is a contamination in in the environment, it's not going to be transferred to your sensor. This is also very important in uh, biomedical applications because in biomedical applications there's a possibility that you use your sensor for several different uh, environments. Uh, categories, methods, and so on. So you don't want to, let's say, you bring uh, contamination from one measurement to another measurement. And basically, this kind of contamination is one of the main uh, source of the contaminations in hospitals, especially when they are using, let's say, one device or one measurement device from one patient to another patient, especially when the device is in a contact with the patient's bodies and, and the skins. So microwave brings us the opportunity for non-contact operation, which is very useful for biomedical applications. In my lab also, we have demonstrated that these kind of the devices can also be used for gas sensing, which means if there is a gas existing in the environment, uh, through a chain of uh, conversion, uh, gas will affect the, uh, the permittivity and conductivity of the sensors environment and then you can translate that to the response of the sensor. So these are, these applications has already been published in several journals recently and uh, back to a couple of years ago. Uh, recently we have dem demonstrated that okay these devices are also very useful for pipeline breach and uh, and and integrity uh, monitoring purposes. This is something that maybe could be or could be interesting for lots of different companies from uh, different perspective. First of all, it can reduces the hazards and the risk of uh, explosion and so on and so forth. And at the same time, uh, from uh, environmental perspective, it's very important because if there is a leak or there is a potential for a leak, you, you can get a, an alert in time and on time sometimes. So uh, we have also demonstrated that a combination of the UV uh, of the of the microwave devices with some uh, materials, including nanotubes, nanostructures, or even just the uh, 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 semiconductors, can also make some uh, UV and light detection or brings UV and light detection in microwave region. We are still working on it and there's there are, there will be a couple of new papers coming up on this area which is very unique and very interesting that opens lots of doors for microwave sensing. Uh, we also demonstrate that it's also can be used for non-contact flow detection. So let's say if you one of the biggest problems in the in the uh, in the flow meters is the falling that can happen because of the materials and the liquid. Uh, let's say liquid with with oil is just passing through the flow meter, and then because of the falling uh, effect, the flow meter start to get the the, the cross section of the flow meter start to get the size of the or the dimension start to get reduced, and then based on that, the measurements start to uh, 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 go with with a little bit larger and larger errors. So uh, the method that we have introduced here it can be applied for industrial applications so in that case the 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 falling would have less and less impact in our measurements 
Uh, but these are mainly the other applications of the microwave devices. But today I'm mainly going to talk about the ice sensor and ice detection. So uh, the first question is why we need to study ice and uh, why this ice and snow de detection is important. So I can categorize ice and uh, snow detection and the importance of that in a couple of different uh, uh, industries. First of all, for the transportation, this is very obvious. We have always uh, experienced, especially during the winter time when we are traveling by airplanes, there is a de-icing process is always happening because icing can affect airplanes' wings from two different perspectives. First of all, it can stick and stuck the 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 uh, the the airplanes, and then it uh, causes malfunctioning to the wings. And, that the, and the second thing is uh, if we have a thick or a little bit thicker layers of the ice on the wings, then that can affect the aerodynamics of the wings. So uh, it can affect the, 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 uh, the force that it's, or the thrust that we need to, to uh, take off and then properly uh, control the airplane. Uh, on the road, Icing can cause lots of lots of accidents, which is directly related to the hazard and that's directly related to the life of the people. So uh, we have experienced lots of uh, lots of lots of uh, icy roads, especially on the bridges, uh, because we have the airflow from the top and the bottom of the bridge. So you can easily have an ice formation, a very thin layer of ice on the on the roads, and uh, sometimes we call them black ice because they are thin. So you still feel that you are driving on the um, on the concrete or on the on the uh, road, uh, which there is no ice over there, but definitely there is a thin layer of ice, and that thin layer of ice can create uh, sliding and accidents. And uh, footpath and driveways at at home. Uh, so this is one application. So transportation is there is no question it's a problematic. The ice and snow is a problematic. Uh, the other one is the green energy and green power generation. So I'm not sure if you are uh, you you have you are aware of this or not. But back to a year or two years ago, there was a very cold, icy condition uh, happened in in Texas in U.S. And uh, because of the ice and the snow, they had to shut down lots of their their uh, wind turbines. And when did they that? When when they did that, uh, the um, the um, uh, energy generation was affected and there was lots of blackouts due to the stop of the energy generation uh, due to the ice formation. So we were working with a, uh, with a, with a, uh, a good supporter of us uh, down to US and uh, the company called RWE and they sent us a couple of pictures. These are real pictures that we got from the site. These are not from a Google or something. <laughs> These are real photos that we got from, from RWE. And as you can see, there's a huge, huge amount of the ice created over the over the blade of the of the uh, wind turbines uh, so definitely there are, and solar panels could be another kind of uh, issues again ice formation or snow formation over the solar panels can also affect the uh, efficiency of the electrical energy generation other industries such as cold weather machinery industrial planets pipelines uh, and uh, these days, specifically, drones are other areas that uh, uh, ice formation can reduce their proper operation, uh, and uh, also they, they can affect their their operation time. Specifically related to the drones, uh, when they are flying around, especially the big drones, uh, in an icy condition, they need to turn on the the icing system and keep it on uh, uh, if they don't have any feedback system to detect ice. So therefore, they are uh, losing the battery and they are losing the energy. Uh, so they, 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 they have a limited operation time when the, when the um, uh, de-icing system is on on the drones. So therefore, definitely there is a need for ice
Hi, Muhammad. Can you hear us? Uh, I think we have lost him. For a few minutes, I thought that I am the person experiencing <laughs> Same. I think he's trying to jo join again, so we wait for him for a couple of minutes to see. Hi, Mohammed. I think Hi. I missed you. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know what happened. Uh, so, are you still hearing me? Yes. We can see okay. you and we can hear you now. Okay. So, I don't know where I lost the connection. So did you see this photo and this uh, slide? It was on this slide. Yes, oh, it was OK. Here. OK, so yeah, maybe just briefly I can explain what I was talking about. So these are some of the photos that we got from our collaborators back down in US. So RWE, RWE is uh, owning big, uh, uh, let's say, uh, wind, uh, wind uh, uh, farms, and uh, they they send these photos back, to, uh, and these photos are related to the ice storm that happened in US back to a year ago or year and a half ago, and due to this ice storm, they had to uh, shut down their their wind turbines, and when they did that, they uh, they they had a huge cutoff on the on their electricity generation, so. It seems that the ice formation on the wind turbines and the, especially the green energy generators are a very important issue, and they need to uh, address that. And as you can see this in this in this um, uh, figure um, over here, uh, even de-icing the big uh, wind turbines is a is an expensive and uh, and uh, kind of a uh, challenging uh, process. As you can see, you need to stop the generator and then uh, uh, go through the de-icing process and after that uh, and you need to repeat the same thing for each blade and so on and so forth and then during another procedure you need to bring this back to the uh, back to the network um, so based on the communication that we had with the with the collaborators that we have they told us that if they can detect ice formation on the blades in early stages so they can shut off their 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 uh, wind turbines because it seems that if you have a nucleation of the uh, nucleates of the ice and then because of the rotation of the blades then you accumulate more and more and more ice on, on the blade and therefore the icing is getting more and more challenging. But if you just know that, okay, there's an icing condition out there and it's the time to, and uh, right away you shut down your, your, your uh, generator and you stop the blades, then you will get less ice. So the de-icing would be much easier and faster and then bringing the generator back to the network will be much faster. So therefore there's a need for that. So for the first time when I started to look into this problem, I wouldn't expect to see a, such a big change or what, such a big difference in the dielectric properties of ice, water with respect to air. So uh, when my students start to take a look into this um, problem, uh, 
we look into the water's uh, dielectric properties and the water's, di wa water's dielectric property is in a range of 90, uh, 75 up to 90 and uh, the loss tangent or the loss introduced by the molecules of the water because of their dipole structure is around 0 0.3. Uh, but one day when we were running the experiment and we create ice on top of one of the sensors, we noticed that the dielectric properties of the ice is extremely lower than the dielectric property of water. And it's very close with respect to the loss uh, to air. So that means that it's not as lossy, the ice is not as lossy as water, and the dielectric properties of that is at least 30 times less than water. So that gives us right away the idea that how about we use these microwave technology to de detect and distinguish between the water and the ice on the sensors. So before going to the research and then before explaining the whole thing, I just want to mention that this presentation and the work that I'm going to present in this presentation is mainly uh, the, the main contributions of Omid Nixon, my PhD student, Aryaman, my master, Aryaman Shah, my master's student, Keaton Kolegrov and uh, Mandeep uh, Jain, my my uh, lab manager. And here you can see the group, uh, my my team at the University of British Columbia. We have we have a, a team of or maybe around 15 people, including three to four postdocs, uh, four to six uh, PhD students, and up to 10 to 12 uh, master's students, and maybe a couple of undergrad researchers that they are working with us and helping us developing uh, uh, circuits and systems for uh, different applications. But this work is mainly prepared by these four people that they help me on the development of this technology. So the first experiment that we started to look into is the ice and frost detection. So what we did, we just bring our sensor, put it on top of the Peltier, and the Peltier is a device that can create a very low temperature, let's say minus 10, and then we start to detect uh, the changes in the environment. So as you can see, uh, when there is no droplet and it's just the environment, when you in, 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 in st when, when when the uh, sensor is started to uh, reduce the, the, the surface temperature of the sensor, because of the condensation that can happen from the environment uh, humidity, we can have a frost created on top of the sensor. So when the frost is started to, to, to form on the sensor, we notice that, okay, the changes start to happen on the resonant frequency. So as you can see, the peaks are start to move. And uh, then we heat it up the sensor and then bring it back to the environment or, or room temperature, let's say uh, 23 degree. And this, uh, this frost that was uh, uh, was formed on the sensor, start to melt and thaw, and then as you can see, we see a big, cha a big change and big shift when the thawing is happening, which means that we have a mot mot water molecules on the sensor. So this was the very first experiment that we started uh, the ice sensor devices with that. And uh, here uh, on figure B and C and D, uh, basically it's the same thing that we demonstrated here in figure A. The only difference is on figure B, we just monitor the resonant amplitude, which is the peak of the, of the resonant profile versus time. And on the C, we monitor the resonant frequency, which is the frequency of the peak or of the resonant profile uh, where, the, where the amplitude is reaching to the maximum value versus time, and we notice that there's a good change. And this change is happening, and as, as you can see, everything is plotted versus temperature. So the temperature is constant, but our curve is, is still going down. So that uh, definitely de uh, demonstrates that the sensor is not dependent to the temperature. The sensor is basically monitoring uh, more and more accumulation of, uh, th uh, of, of uh, frost on top on, on the surface of the sensor. And the same thing is happening on the, on the resonant amplitude. It's, uh, the temperature is constant, but the resonant amplitude is increasing and increasing, that means that there is accumulation and accumulation of, of, uh, of frost happening on the sensor. So this was something very interesting because we talked to other uh, collaborator, if, uh, to uh, other collaborators that we have, and most of them, they mentioned that 
frost detection for them is a little bit challenging because the way and the method of the ice detection that they are they have used and they are using currently is based on the resistive method. So in the resistive methods, detection of the frost is challenging and sometimes it's uh, it's very, very, um, I would say, inaccurate. Um, the second experiment that we did after we did the frost detection, so we, we noticed that we can detect frost. So the second experiment that we did, we had the sensor again on top of a pelt here, which is a cool cooling stage and bring the surface a bit and, and just keep the surface of the temperature, uh, surface temperature of the sensor under room temperature and put a droplet of water on top of it. So we start to reduce the temperature of the sensor to minus 10 degree. And as you can see on figure A, we have at time zero, we have water. At time it is equal to three minute and six minute and 10 minute after that at minus 10 degree C, we have a complete ice formation. So as you can see, uh, figure A shows the results of the sensor. So as, as soon as we put a droplet of water, because as you noticed in the previous slides, I mentioned that the dielectric properties of the water is AD and it is lossy. So it's almost killed the signal. But as soon as the, the, the uh, water start to freeze and then it becomes ice, then the resonant amplitude and resonant profile start to form. So this is what we have observed during the freezing, freezing period. After freezing, uh, we, we, do, we did tying, which, uh, thawing, which, which means uh, we introduce heat or bring back the sensor, sub, uh, sensor surface to the room temperature. And then we notice that again, the peak or the resonant profile is start to die because now this time we are going from ice to water. So we, uh, this experiment was very, it was the key experiment for in our uh, investigation because now we notice that we can detect ice formation and tying uh, using their microwave resonator. Then talking to different uh, 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 different collaborators, especially for the applications that we have in the roads for for uh, safety of the roads, uh, we noticed that in some places they use salt in order to melt the ice in the road. So therefore, we should be able to measure uh, the ice formation in the presence or existence of uh, salt. So that's why we call them salt ice uh, or salt water uh, and ice mixture. So uh, the experiment that we performed, uh, we came up with a different structure because the conventional microwave structures, they couldn't detect uh, 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 salty water because of the salt in the environment. Salt is, uh, water is by itself, it's a, it's a lossy material. Salt increases the loss, so it's a double lossy material, so it's making the detection difficult and difficult. So in order to be able to detect salt water, we need to change the structure of our microwave resonator. So we introduce a new structure of the microwave resonators, and then we could successfully detect a different, uh, a different percentage of the salt in the water, up to 10% of the salt, which is a lot of salt in the water, which in reality, uh, based on our communication, it seems that they use a three to 5% of the salt to be able to uh, de-ice the roads in, the, in, the, in areas like Ontario in Canada. So in this slide, you can see the results of this experiment, and we successfully demonstrate that we could detect uh, salt ice formation on the microwave sensor. So that means that microwave sensor is still a very powerful tool to provide this sort of detection. Uh, we keep going because after you detect the ice, now you need to take the second step. The second step is the way to de-ice the environment. Or as an example, in some experiments, uh, our clients asked us, okay, you detect ice, you have the ice on the sensor, now you need to de-ice and then be prepared for another measurement or for the next measurement. So therefore, we had to come up with a structure that we also have a heater embedded in our microwave resonators. So microwave resonators, looking from the top side, it's as I mentioned, it's a trace of single materials. From the bottom side, there is a solid uh, one part ground plane. So uh, we came up with this innovative methods that instead of having a, a solid one part 
uh, uniform ground plane, we can uh, make non-uniform meander shape structure. So therefore, basically you can make a thin traces and with these thin traces, you can apply DC voltage and with DC voltage, you can create heater. So with this kind of a change that we apply to the microwave sensors structures because microwave people they always use the uh, sensor with a solid and uniform ground layer we could be able to in also in integrate the heater inside the uh, sensor so therefore we don't uh, need for any external heater and so on and so forth so we have investigated the application of this in uh, in in ice detection also we added a little bit of uh, coding such as the coding was called super hydrophobic so we had an, a, a super hydrophobic coding on top of the sensors uh, and we also demonstrate that the super hydrophobic sensor using uh, with them uh, uh, using a microwave sensor for the first time we demonstrate that the super hydrophobic surfaces can delay the ice formation significantly. So now we have, um, uh, and, 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 uh, and basically this super hydrophobic material is acting as a coating on top of the microwave sensor. And this is another advantage of a microwave sensor because DC or, or, or resistive based sensors or ice detections, you need to have a direct contact between the electrodes of your sensor with the liquid or with the water and the ice in the environment. However, the microwave, as I mentioned, it's operating based on the waves, so we don't need to have a direct contact. So therefore, we coat our microwave device with the coating, which is super hydrophobic, which means that when you have a droplet of water, it doesn't like the water, so it repels that from the surface, and at the same time can detect the existence of that water. So therefore, we are seeing beyond the coating and other side of the coating and detect water or ice. And we successfully demonstrate that according to these results, again, we have temperature, we have time and resonant amplitude and resonant frequency. We demonstrate that the untreated or uncoated um, sensor uh, gets ice faster on, on it than the, the treated sensor. So here they are the diff or coated sensors. He's, here is the difference. So for the same same small size of the uh, size, uh, size of the uh, sensor, basically the ice formation on the on the uh, treated and coated sensor is uh, delayed by twice of the ice formation that happens on the uh, non-treated or uncoated sensor. So we didn't stop there. Again, keep talking to the different vendors and uh, and collaborators and the companies. They came back to us and said that, okay, most of the time they want to have a kind of a protective coating on top of the sensors in order to make sure that uh, the sensor's lifetime can stay for five to 10 years or even more and more. So therefore they use some sort of epoxy on top of the sensor. So they were asking us, okay, how about these microwave sensors uh, can operate with the existence of the epoxy. So here in this slide, we are showing you that with the existence of the epoxy, we can still detect ice and we can still detect and distinguish that from water. So if there's a water, you can see this, the, the graph is green, the, the graph is blue. And uh, when this water droplet that we put it on the uh, sensing region becomes, uh, becomes uh, ice, then we have this red uh, dot and therefore uh, there's a huge difference or big difference uh, between the ice and water. And just keep in mind that there is a one millimeter of epoxy existence on the top of the sensor. That means that this epoxy makes a barrier between the ice or water droplet and the sensor underneath. So we didn't stop there. We keep going with other applications. Some other uh, collaborators, they were asking about, okay, is it possible to detect ice and then wirelessly communicate that to another uh, station or another location? So we demonstrate that not only the resonators, but also other structures such as planar antennas can also be used for the detection of the ice. Here, the setup that we prepared, we put the ice detection on a in a box with a distance of let's say two uh, 1.8 meter 
up to two meter distance from the antenna. This distance can be extended easily to a uh, couple of uh, hundreds of meters. So we demonstrate that when we have ice and when we have water, we have different signatures. So therefore, it can be used for the detection of the ice and water. And it has been published in, uh, I believe it's a scientific report that we uh, published this paper and this work. Uh, we didn't again stop there. People were interested to know if we can detect different thickness of the ice and uh, different thickness of the uh, or amount of water and ice on the microwave sensors. We investigated that by adding one droplet, freezing the droplet, measuring the response and adding an extra or second droplet, freezing that and measuring the thickness of the ice on top of the sensor and the response and the results is uh, the the, conclu the conclusion for the results are uh, the results are uh, yes we can detect the different thickness of the ice and uh, we can distinguish even be the differences between the different thickness of the ice using microwave devices uh, we apply the same technology we try to reduce the requirement uh, for battery or external power source for our sensors by changing the structure of the microwave devices to something called um, uh, absorbing uh, surfaces or, or uh, uh, reflective surfaces. So uh, we just recently in a recent publication on, in IEEE microwave uh, transaction, we demonstrate that uh, you don't need to have a battery. You can have a structure of the microwave, passive microwave structures uh, and using a inter integrator, uh, interrogator antenna, you can definitely detect ice formation uh, on the, on the, the uh, different uh, uh, structures and, uh, and even you can make it flexible to put it on the different uh, uh, part of, let's say, uh, drone wings and, uh, and, uh, and uh, 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 wind turbine blades. <clears throat> Uh, most of the previous experiments that we did, they were performed in the in a very quiet lab environment. So that means that we didn't have that much of noise. But uh, in real world application, definitely noise is also existed in the environment and it, that can affect our measurements. So in order to reduce the effect of the noise, we introduced some machine learning methods. So therefore, the measurements that we did, let's say for ice, bear, and water, we introduced 5% of the noise to the measured uh, signals and then trained our uh, machine learning algorithms and then uh, uh, train the algorithm with different ice conditions. Uh, with with different ice condition and with different noise amount in the environment. And we uh, successfully demonstrate that the machine learning uh, could be a very, very successful and powerful method to help us to properly distinguish the difference between air, ice, and water on the sensor. So therefore, we make them make these sensors more and more advances towards the industrial applications. Uh, this is the paper that we have recently published in uh, Nature Communication. So one thing that all these people are asking us is, can we engineer the surface in a way that after we detect the ice, by just using the centrifugal force of the blades, can we do the ice or de-icing uh, without really uh, melting the ice? So in this paper, we demonstrate that if you properly heat up some critical points on the on the uh, alongside of the alongside of the blades, then just by using the centrifugal force, you would be able to shed the yes. ice before getting the ice yes. to the minus five degrees. And um, so we have done some. Uh, uh, we have submitted some patents on the uh, the icing and the ice detection systems. Here are the patents that we have submitted, and uh, uh, the the patent was accepted, but still under investigation and under review. So we are waiting for the response of the patent, and then after that we will proceed with the uh, final. Uh, submission. Here is another experiment that we did on the snow detection. So ice and snow detection, they are two different things. Snow is more fluffy, it has more uh, water inside, and also it's it has more air inside. So therefore, detection of snow is also important. This is the experiment that we did in a snow chamber. So as you can see, uh, different 
thickness of the snow was measured using the microwave sensor and uh, here is the result so we apply snow so you can see that the, the responses start to change and then we keep the snow constant or there, there was no snowing condition so the, the thickness of the snow was constant then again another snowing and then again the snow was stopped so the thickness was constant and again another snowing condition and then keep the snow uh, the, the snow off which means that the thickness of the snow on top of the sensor was constant so as you can see microwave devices again very successfully can detect with the different thickness of the snow uh, formation over the over the sensor this is also important especially for the pathways or for the uh, for the uh, civil applications because when people have uh, heaters in the pathways so they want to know when should they turn on their snow they, they should uh, turn on their heaters to get rid of the snow in their pathway in front of their houses so uh, keeping that uh, heaters on can cost them a lot keeping it off and not using it, that means that there's a hazard of trip. So therefore, um, uh, ice and snow detection in those environments are very critical to know when to turn on the, uh, the, the heaters and when to turn off the heaters in order to, uh, to, to operate efficiently. Uh, we keep applying this uh, technology to, to uh, aerospace uh, uh, aerospace in, uh, uh, industry. We tested our sensors in uh, National Research Council of Canada's facility in wind, turbine, wind tunnel uh, when the ice particles was traveling with the 720 uh, kilometers per hour and then it hit, they were hitting the sensor. So the sensor was uh, uh, successfully could measure the ice uh, condition in the environment. So you can see that we have a uh, ice and then there was no ice and then ice condition and then we turn on the heater so it goes back so it demonstrates that if you install them in the, in the sensors on the on the wing of the airplane you can properly measure uh, when the when you can properly monitor when the ice formation is happening and when you turn on your heaters you can properly demonstrate that oh now the ice is gone so the flight can can be proceed with no uh, potential hazard so we're still working on this technology with the nrc and some other partners to make sure that uh, we can make it and bring it to a commercial level uh, we implemented some softwares uh, we, we have some app development uh, by some of my uh, students and engineers. So uh, um, uh, you don't need to have a very expensive device to monitor ice in different surfaces. You can have a simple phone and then you can have this, uh, this uh, app installed on your phone and then you can put the sensor at some point or where uh, where you feel that uh, you want to monitor the ice formation and just by walking around and then uh, getting close to the sensors you can uh, detect if there is ice or if there is nothing so you can see that there is nothing on the sensor so both wings are green if there is water so one ring it has a water so uh, the the uh, the app app demonstrate that there is a water and if there is a ice so we can detect ice and we can alert the user that there is a ice formation is happening so then here is this slide that we demonstrate our supporters we got lots of support from department of defense of canada we got support from uh, national research council of canada NSERC canada and uh, innovation uh, uh, canadian foundation for the innovation in canada and we are also working with different companies uh, towards the development of of these sensors uh, here are the list of some of the publications that we had and we have uh, made on the ice sensing and we are still working on it and we are keeping publishing and and uh, uh, demonstrating other kind of applications of these uh, resonators especially in the snow and ice detection to the world and uh, yeah basically that is it thank you very much Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Zarifi. Uh, uh, thank you that uh, we appreciate the time you took. Uh, thank you for being with us and for an outstanding presentation. Um, now is the time for questions. If there is any question, please ask Dr. Zarifi. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, may, may I start the question? Uh, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zarifi, for the very excellent presentation. I really enjoyed it. As a person which was grown up in a uh, city which had experienced the cold and the snow and uh, ice, uh, it was a very good uh, point for me to remember those things. It's almost 15 years that I'm just on the other side of the world, which I'm experiencing always on the hot days. So. <laughs> Uh, one uh, interesting uh, thing that came into my mind is was uh, the impact of humidity. Of course, mm -hmm. it might not be too possible, probably in the Canadian situation, which you either try to understand the snow or the ice level. But uh, did you have any studies to see that whether if there is humidity, would it to some extent uh, affect the results? Will it cause error or not? The, uh, you, your algorithm has already taken into account those things. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Dr. Shania, for an excellent question, uh, because this question, answering to this question is going to reveal one of the unpublished work, but I, uh, I, I, I don't hesitate to do so, so I'll let you know what we are doing. Yes, absolutely, humidity, even in Canada, also is important. So it can affect the measurement results. It's not significantly affecting, but still, you know, the accuracy is important for us from the sensing point of view. So therefore, yes, we see some changes due to the existing of the humidity. So in order to solve that, what we are doing and what my current students and uh, postdocs are working on it, we are, uh, most of the sensors that you observe, we had just one sensor and that one sensor was measuring the environment. But you know that most of the sensors that we have, they haven't, they are like a pairs. So one sensor monitors the environment and one sensor is just isolated from the environment and just measuring and using and can be used as a reference point. Right. So, yes, in order to solve that issue, we now we are moving to the stage that we need to have two resonators or two sensors, basically. One sensor is measuring the snow and the environmental parameters. The other sensor is embedded, and that sensor is independent of the snow, but it can be affected by humidity. So let's say you have two parameters. If the only humidity is changing, both of them start to move, but because one of them is exposed to snow, so if there is a snow, only one start to move. So therefore, the differential measurement cancel, cancels out the effect of the permit uh, of the humidity in the environment. Yeah, perfect, perfect, fantastic. Thank you. Thanks very and, much. And and yeah, and basically, I'm not sure if this is applicable to you, but maybe something that I can share also with you. So as you notice that we detect snow using the microwave devices, but uh, I'm not sure if this is the case in Australia, but this is the case in lots of Middle East, especially UAE and uh, Saudi Arabia, that they have lots of um, uh, wind uh, panels and uh, sorry, the, the solar panels, and that they are dealing with dust. So yeah. with the same method that we are detecting ice, we can detect dust. So yeah. Yeah. maybe for Australia, detecting dust is more important than detecting the snow. Maybe exactly. next time you can invite me for detecting <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely, but yeah, definitely. yeah, this is this is also something that we are working on it. Exactly. And as you correctly mentioned, in cent in certain parts of Australia, exactly, it's more uh, we, we do have the sand issue, which uh, when the when it's windy, the sand is blown over the photovoltaic cells. And uh, interestingly, in such areas, we can see that more and more there is a possibility of electricity generation from solar systems because of the abundance of uh, iridians. And th that's a fantastic way. Uh, I know that there is usually a regular uh, requirement for cleaning those things, but as far as I know, I'm, I'm not aware, but uh, probably there doesn't exist any uh, sensors and that maintenance happens like regularly on a couple of months basis. But th yeah. that's a very interesting application. Yeah, yeah that's absolutely the, the reason that we re received the kind of a request from one of the industrial partner to look into this problem because they don't want to do it regular basis because with regular basis, you don't know you should clean the solar cells after two days 
or you should do it after two months. So if you do it too late, again, the efficiency is decreasing. If you do it too early, that means that you are spending more and more fund and money on the cleaning than the yeah. energy generation. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, let's go ahead with the other. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Shainio. Uh, do you have any more questions? Uh, if there are no questions, I may have a second question as well. Uh, and that is maybe about the uh, the battery usage of the sensors. So in one of the probably the very latest slides, I noticed that uh, probably there is not a significant energy consumption by the by the sensor itself. Absolutely. Uh, so, so how is that requirement is uh, like uh, what is generally uh, needed for for a sensors uh couple of yeah. hours or couple of years of operation uh in terms of absolutely energy? absolutely i can maybe comment on that by just showing you this slide so we have two different sort of uh devices or sensors so one of these sensors I don't know if you see my, let me. Yes, yes, we see that here. Uh, just a pointer, okay. So here, as you can see, this is called uh, passive surfaces or passive engineered surfaces. So that means that there is no battery involved. So the lifetime of these sensors is, let's say, as many years that they can mechanically stay there. So there's no battery requirement. So but basically what we do is we install these sensors and then you have a secondary drone or maybe secondary antenna and then uh, or the ground operators, they can just come and walk around these sensors and then start to walk, watch their phones and see that if they can detect any weird signal and that weird signal to tell them that there is a ice uh, icy condition is happening on the on the on the wing or not so these kind of sensors the sensor itself doesn't consume any energy basically the sensor is receiving energy from the transmitter on the on the user's hand and then rep reports it reports back to the transmitter so therefore uh, the energy is the battery requirement something like the, the one that you are using on your phone however we have other structures that i can show it maybe here so on these ones as you can see we have two uh, let's say transmission lines one is on the right and the other one is on the left. So they are connected to a circuit like this. So if you want to use this circuit directly with the sensor, we, we are operating these devices with 3.3 volts and the requirements is around maybe 100 milliamp. So therefore they can stand or they can, they can operate for at least maybe 10 to 20 hours. So 10 to 20 hours, and even that can be extended to maybe um, 100 hours based on the, cap the capacity of your batteries. But maybe in the first glance, you feel that, oh, it's just 10 hours. So that means that it, it can't even stand for one day. But just keep in mind, these sensors, ice condition and ice uh, formation is a timely process so you don't need to monitor your surfaces every single minute so you can turn on your sensor monitor it for two minutes and then turn it off and then wait for another couple of hours maybe three hours and then again turn it on and then monitor the environment and again for just two minutes and turn it off and so on so you can extend or expand the lifetime of the sensor to at least a year or two yeah perfect perfect fantastic that's great thank you yeah i, I just noticed there is a uh, message in the chat box so please go ahead thanks oh sure uh just second if I can okay uh, the qu uh, is it question pattern is amazing I'm interested to know if you have tested the ice and snow sensor in a real <coughs> life scenario if you have tested them uh, okay so Raja that's a very good question actually on the 
paper that we publish in Nature Communication, um, the first review reviewer or the first round of the review, they asked us to put the sensor outside in the environment and then monitor it and then monitor the results. So I believe yes, we did that and uh, we monitor we we use it for three months outside in the outside condition. There was rain, they, there was dust, there was snow, there was ice. Everything was sitting on it and then we were measuring the results and then reported back to the uh, respected reviewer who asked about that. So yes, we did it, but still uh, we are planning to uh, run a couple of very very, very extent, extensive experiments this uh, winter and especially in the in the NRC and uh, there is another facility called AMIL in in Quebec uh, so there's a uh, the, yes we are planning to do all these extensive measurements in very extreme uh, weather conditions in upcoming February so the next question is uh, uh, some kind of a hydrophobic active polymer that imaginary part of the dielectric constant could be used. So, so thank you, Farid, for the <laughs> for the question. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. It seems that I'm revealing all the hidden uh, research that it's happening in my lab, but no problem. <laughs> so yes. Um, for the first time, when we start to think about this, we thought that, okay, we are using microwave to detect ice. Can we use microwave to melt the ice as well? So, and this is the same way that you do the microwave at home. So you heat up your glass of water or you, you heat up your coffee and so on. So initially it was more like a science fiction for us and everyone in the lab was thinking oh is it possible it's not possible we investigate ice and it's loss and because ice is not lossy uh, the, then microwave heating is a little bit challenging with that but then we came up with some polymers they are called p.pss so p.pss is a kind of a conductive polymer that we can use for 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 microwave and the dc voltage transmission applications. So uh, now we are investigating that to see if the, the, the loss that we can get in microwave region from P.PSS can be used for heating the surfaces without really applying DC voltages. So your point is well taken. This is absolutely correct. And we are looking into that. Thank you, Dr. Zarifi. Um, thank you everyone for asking the question. Uh, do we have any more question? All right, uh, I think there's no more question. Thank you everyone for attending and special thanks to Dr. Zarifi for a wonderful and fantastic uh, presentation. Thank you again and uh, extra thanks uh, considering the time. Uh, which is in very, very early morning. Uh, I would like to share that uh, you can find the record of this presentation in, uh, in our uh, YouTube channel. I copy the link uh, in Teams now. Everyone can access to that one. Uh, we try to put it in our channel uh, within two to three business days and you can go and uh, see the presentation again. Thank you, everyone. And thank you again, Dr. Zarifi. Thanks a lot for inviting me. It was a great pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thanks very much. It was great to see you and hear you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank Have you. a good rest Bye. of your day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Have Bye. a good morning. Thanks. Bye.